Hi, I'm Jared Potter, and we're talking about designing for Windows Phone 201. In this section, uh, we'll talk a little bit about me, which is uh, for the last three years, I've been working on Windows Phone. It's been my passion to be in the design studio, and I was design integration lead in the mobile studio for over three years. Currently, um, I'm the principal designer at 6 Half Studios. If you have any questions about these, you can always get a hold of me on Twitter at Jared T. Potter or LinkedIn at Jared T. Potter. Uh, today we're going to be talking about three different things. We're going to be talking about the system on Windows Phone, composition, and in this piece we'll be talking about uh, sort of page templates and how you'll create motion and integrate all that. Uh, and then last of, of all, we're going to be talking about the controls that you'll be able to use as a designer as well as the APIs that are made avail available for you on Windows Phone. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is the system. Now, uh, the first piece of the system is sort of the navigation model, but you wouldn't be able to talk about the navigation model if it wasn't for the hardware that the system was provided in. So we have a hardware spec, and obviously there's lots of different manufacturers and OEMs making really great phones like HTC and Nokia, but every single phone has some similar traits. One of the traits is that every single phone has a power and sleep button. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get to the UI at all without the power and sleep button. We have a volume up and down that controls obviously the volume, but also shows and hides a little bit of UI that allows you to skip forward and backwards through tracks. So that'll become necessary if you're working on an audio application where you're using background audio or anything like that. We have camera. We're going to talk more about that. You have lenses, controls, and some really fun, exciting functionality. We've got a back, start, and a search button at the bottom, and I'll talk about those in detail. Uh, so the very first thing is the start button. When a user presses the start button, this takes you to the iconic start screen that you see in Windows Phone with the live tiles, the action, and the icons that are all seen there displayed on the screen. Now one thing to note about this, the developer or designer has really no access to this. By default, when you press this button, it always will go back to the start screen and jump you out of whatever application either you've created or ever th whatever third-party application you're in at the time. The next hardware button to think about is the search button. The search button is always on the bottom right hand side and also this will always fire you basically into the Bing search. This is a global search across the whole system. You also have little control over this. You can use it uh, especially to jump out and look at search and go into a global search but not really a piece that you're going to customize or put some control on. The one that you have the most control over is the back button. The hardware back button is used to navigate back on pages and screens within applications or between applications. This is something that you actually do have control over in your history, although we really want you to use it in a consistent way across Windows Phone, similar to how we're using it in the, in the shipped applications that come with Windows Phone. Another thing to note about the hardware back button is that it does more than just let you go back from one application in the history stack to another or from one page to the other. It actually, on a press and hold, zooms out from the UI and allows you to jump and multitask back through the pages that you were working on. This is a really cool, quick piece of functionality. One of the ways that it works is if you were to tap on the last item, these would swap place, allowing you to flip between two applications if you were copying and pasting and doing other multitask. This is similar to how uh, dragging in from the left side of the screen on Windows 8 works for multitasking. So one of the things, I'm going to start off today talking a little bit about the navigation model and the history stack. And, and one of the things that I'd like to point out, the very first thing that I'd like to point out, remember back means back, not forward, not sideways, but back. On Windows Phone, we have a hub and spoke navigation model, meaning this is sort of the hub or the starting points, and then these are the spokes that go out from the beginning. If you hit the start button, you're always going to end up going back to that start screen, that home screen. Likewise, as you drill out into the applications, if you hit the back button, you'll continuously go backwards up towards that start screen. If there's nothing left in the history stack, you will end up back at the start screen. So let's do the, and a quick example of that. Here, this has been the same since the first version of Windows Phone, where you would start on an old start screen. You'd click and go into something like the People Hub. After that, you'd click and maybe go in to see your what's new, or actually in this case, you're in a panorama, so you would just pan over to the right-hand side and see what's new. And you might click on a social feed. When you see that social feed, if you hit the back button, you would go back, of course, to the panorama that you're from. But one of the things that I'd like to point out is that moving sideways left and right in both a pivot or a panorama, just interacting on the same page, doesn't add or remove anything from the history stack. So if I was to hit back again, 
it would actually remove all that history. That's all been the same since Windows Phone 7. It's been consistent and it's never changed. Uh, another thing, another way to look at this is we, if we were to start out at the People Hub, click on a contextual menu, which is a press and hold, and I'll get into that later, talking a little bit about contextual menus and other systems. And I was to do something like pin that item to the start screen. It would kick me out to the old start screen, once again, the same since the beginning. And then if I were to click on that person's contact card, it would go directly into the contact card. The only difference with this, and if I pivot over, of course, in their history and look at that, is that when I start to go backwards, back up this history stack, you'll go back to history, back to the profile, back to start screen. But remember, this step that I did was a press and hold. It was just a contextual menu. So I would actually skip that and go right back to the People Hub. So by default, one of the things that you need to remember is that you can do some manipulation of the back stack. As a developer or a programmer, anything that might be something like a shopping cart or a, a modal window or something that pops up that gives you options, you might want to remove, right? It gave you the option to pin that to the start screen or edit it or delete it. After you've done that and you hit back, you don't really want to go back and say, hey, do you want to edit this again? Most likely you do not and you've already completed that function. Uh, so something like this, this is a great example. You're going into a shop cart or a wish list. You do some billing. You put in your credit card, you pay for that, and then you're finished. If you hit the back button, you don't want to have to pay for all that stuff again. You'll just jump right back into the shopping experience. So that's kind of how we want you to use and manipulate the back stack. Uh, here's another example of that with search results. Jumping from the front and the back, but more, most likely in most of these scenarios, we just want you to continuously use the system that was created for you. Uh, there are a couple of uh, places and UIs that you would absolutely want to remove, which are like transient UIs, uh, loading screens that come in that have nice animations. Maybe you built those out as their own page or their own item. Uh, maybe it actually has a pop-up that comes up at the very beginning that allows you to log in. You wouldn't want to, if you hit the back button, be asked to log in again. Once you've logged in, you're logged in for good, unless, of course, you log out. So here's a couple of navigation how-tos when you're using the Windows Phone system. Trust the hardware start and back. Don't try to program around it. Obviously, with the start button, we don't let you do much with it. But with the back button, we do allow you to remove things from the history stack, add things to the history stack. But really, use the system the way it was meant to be uh, used. The second thing I'd like to say is be really predictable. Uh, we are predictable, and we work very hard across the whole OS to be very predictable in the way that you interact with Windows Phone, um, especially with Windows Phone 8. But uh, we don't want you to come in and introduce new navigation models. Um, one of the things that you will notice, you'll notice on Windows Phone, the back button will never delete text in a text box. And we want that to be consistent across, even though you could wire that up. Uh, avoid traps, loops, and phantom pages. We never want you to get in, into a place where you're actually moving in a circle or you get stuck in a navigation model and then you have to hit the home screen to back out. This is also really important because our uh, apps are very tightly integrated. You can jump out to the People Hub and grab a contact, come back into an app. You can pick people out, you can pick music. Like for example, from messaging, you're allowed to add music and it jumps you out to another app and then back in. Well, the last thing we want you to do is accidentally get stuck. If you stick with our navigation model and these simple how-tos, you'll never get stuck. You'll simply be able to go forward and back and navigate the system the way it was meant to be navigated. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to talk about after navigation is the shell. And the shell is made up of a lot of different things. These are all things that are provided to you to make your application take it to the next level. One of the very first things that we'll be talking about is live tiles. Live tiles are beautiful. They're in your face. These are amazing little gems that bubble up information to your application directly to your user. So Windows Phone, since the beginning, has had one form or another of live tiles. In Windows Phone 8, we've actually taken that to the next level, which is a really exciting piece. And since the beginning of Windows Phone, users, as well as sort of the design reviewers, have been very excited about the introduction of live tiles. So let's get started. Live tiles. The user can resize these tiles now between small, medium, or wide at any time. Uh, on Windows Phone 7 and Windows Phone 7.5, you were able to do uh, medium and large now. And a lot of them, you really couldn't make the decision between the two. Uh, now you actually have the choice of doing small, medium, or large. And usually the user, you can provide to the user the option to flip between all three of those sizes. Uh, 
You should provide a user the way to turn the tile notifications off and on at any time within your app. We don't want to force the user to be staring at the live tile updating constantly. It's an option. We want them to be able to use it if that's what they want. Uh, then also, another thing that we've added to Windows Phone 8 is three different tile templates. We've got Flip, Iconic, and Cycle. I'll explain those all to you, and you, I'm sure you guys will use them for, to make your app great. So, first, let's talk a little bit about the tile sizes. Uh, here is small, medium, and large tile size. This is the iconographic tile size. Um, and the way that you're going to want to decide to use these different tile sizes is basically based on whether or not you have the content for these tile sizes. If you don't have a lot of content for a large tile size, don't force the user into using a large tile size. Um, if you don't have the content for a medium as well, uh, use only a small or a medium tile if your app won't use tile notifications to send updates to the user. It's a good rule to live by. Uh, the next thing I'd like to say is the different types of tiles that you can use other than the size. These are the animations that are on the tiles. These are the type of content that you can put in. Um, these are things that are basically plug and play that you can utilize super fast. Uh, first, there's flip. So live tile flip. The flip template provides two surfaces in medium and wide sizes to give users a lot of info. So basically, you have one side of the tile. You can put some text and some content. Uh, and a title, and then that tile will flip over, and on the other side, you'll be revealed with an image or whatever you want the content to be on the back side of the tile. Uh, this is really cool to have two different things. A good use would be a weather app that displays the current temperature on the front and the, and the five day forecast on the back, or a bus tracking app that shows stop and arrival times on the front and a map of the current bus location on the back. Uh, a couple of the bad uses of this would be a train app that displays a logo on the front and then the stops on the back. So you're having to wait when you're looking at the front to get data while you're looking at their branding and then you, once it flips to the back you actually get the time and data. That's the bad use. Instead, you want these both to be kind of the same information but in a different context, right? This is the last update or last thing that was sent in. Here's a little text about it. Just more of the same data. The next is Iconic. The Iconic template displays an image in the center of the tile and is designed to reflect the Windows Phone design principles. So uh, in the small tile and the medium tile, you basically get the icon. In the large template, you're going to get it down in the bottom right-hand corner. This is a really simple, beautiful, and very uh, Windows uh, design language way of presenting your data. A couple of good uses for this is for messaging, voicemail, news readers, general communication apps, anything that sort of has a counter or something that you need to go and see that you've missed items and that you should visit that application. Social networking apps that can taste, convey status, timeline updates, and waiting for notifications, um, maybe even some status previews on the big tile, right? Bad use, updates that rely on images. Um, to convey meaning, photo feeds, or anything that uh, would be basically non-iconographic, right? That's what, this one's all focused on icons. The next thing is cycle. Um, and the cycle template cycles through individual images, basically from a gallery that you've created, and it's one through nine on the tile. So if you have multiple images and you want to kind of feed through them in a beautiful visual way, we've canned that for you. We've made it super available. You don't have to do a lot of work, and they even control the animations that go in between them. It's a beautiful and simple way to make your application feel like a native application that was part of Windows Phone 8's ecosystem from the get-go. Uh, so here's a couple of tiles how-to. How Pick the right template from Flip, Iconic, and Style. Use the, use the uh, how-tos that I mentioned before to kind of choose these, but really think about what fits, fits your application best. Uh, number two, use fresh, frequently updated content that makes customers feel that your app is active when it's not running. If you just have a, a, a converting app, um, uh, a utility converter, any of these kind of applications, you may not need a live tile. Um, you may not have to force your application into a live tile. Really think about when it's required and when it's going to be interesting uh, for the user. Personalized or tailored updates that use what you know about your customer. So this is a really cool one. Because you have a phone, this is their most personal object. They keep it in their pocket. They take it every single place they go. Um, and if you have the data about this person, you know where they're at and all kinds of different things, give them personalized and tailored content to that user. Don't just make it generic content that's being blasted out. The last thing that you want your live tile to be is spam. 
Uh, lastly, content relevant to the customer's current context. Uh, this is very much like the last point, but it's basically like they, you know their location, you know what they're doing, if they're shopping or not. Um, please give them information that's relevant to that context. The next thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about is the page structure of the shell. Uh, so we've got, if you look at a Windows phone, uh, something that may be very familiar to you or very new and exciting to you. Up at the top we have something called the status bar. This is where you can get information about connectivity and all kinds of different things. We have sort of the application space and you as a third party application developer will get to use this. This is sort of your canvas to go to town with. We have an application menu bar um, and an application bar when it's collapsed. This will be your options and menus that you can stuff all your different uh, functionality into for your application. So let's get started. We'll talk first about the system tray. The system tray sits up at the very top of your UI. Uh, it provides you with all the information a user could need to know about their battery, connectivity, Bluetooth, and running services. As a matter of fact, running left to right across the top, you have signal strength, data connection, call forwarding, roaming, wireless networking, signal strength, Bluetooth status, ringer mode, input status, battery power level, and system clock. Now in the last segment, we talked a little bit about the design principles behind Windows Phone. It was all about the content, not the Chrome. It was all about just showing content that's relevant to you and hiding everything else. Uh, the system tray does exactly that. By default, the system tray will be hidden up across the top. Uh, as a third party developer, you can uh, actually show and hide this completely in your application. You could have it appear on screen or you could get rid of it for a full screen application. Uh, by default, the second step that you can do is if anything is important or needs to be bubbled up to you right away, like if the phone battery is dying or if it's plugging in and powering up, or if you're connecting to a new Wi-Fi, one of the individual icons that is the important icon will appear at that time. So here's mine charging. Uh, if you tap anywhere along that top pixels, uh, double tap or tap directly on the, t the time, uh, it'll expand out the system tray and you'll get to see all those options. A couple of the other states of it are text displaying what the status of that current application that you're on is, um, as well as you can modify these properties. Obviously show and hide that I mentioned earlier, the background color that you see us doing in Office, um, the opacity of that overlay, the progress bar. I will get more to progress bars in a little bit later, but the progress bar, this is one spot where you can say globally whether you're loading data down, whether you know when it will be done loading, or whether it's just indeterminate progress, as well as some text. And this could be, say, loading. This could say recent documents are up to date and let the user know that you're completely synced. It's a fantastic global way to show kind of your overall status. So here's a couple of system tray how-tos. Try to show it if at all possible. It's really easy in your application to love your design and make a design that's not really suited for the Windows Phone. It's just a great mobile app. But if you can, turn it on at the top. Make your design around it so that it fits nicely in. You never want an application that's getting used all the time and a user can't even see the time. Uh, the time, the clock, the battery life. One of the great uses of this on Windows Phone is the browser. Uh, by default, it's gone, it's disappeared, and you get a full screen browsing experience. As soon as you tap and expand uh, the address bar at the bottom, you get the data, the time, the alarm clock, everything drops down from the top. So you have a way without leaving the browser to always check the time. Uh, use it for progress or to show status. Uh, you can build this into your own applications. You can write this code. You can have a developer write this code for you, but we've done it for you. All you need to do is fire off the system tray and allow it to open and expand itself and push a little text up to the top. All right, next. Lost my spot there. Sneak peek. Uh, you will be talking about the app bar. So the app bar is basically the menu system in Windows Phone 8. It's been there since the beginning, since we first started in Windows Phone 7, but it's docked at the bottom and it's always at the bottom. Um, actually, unless you go into portrait or landscape mode, in which case it'll go on the left or the right hand side of the screen. There's a couple different steps, uh, states. There is the minimized app bar icon, and this is specifically to be used in panoramas. I'll get um, more into that and you can use it in other scenarios but it was originally designed to be in panorama controls. Uh, there is the default state which is a collapsed version of this and then of course there's the expanded state. By default you get four icon slots to put uh, menu items in. These are little uh, graphical icons 
and they have a single piece of text. This text is very short though. Uh, it doesn't allow you a lot of space, so pre please try to use the shortest words possible. You know, you'll notice on Windows Phone we hardly ever go over seven characters when it comes to this. It's words like new, select, sync, search, and don't ever use two words in that. It's just supposed to be very simple. If you have longer text or something that can't be described with an icon, push it down to the menu items underneath. By a pressing on the dot 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 or a flick gesture up, it'll expand up the application bar and it will show you a scrolling list of the uh, menu items underneath. These can be uh, additional items that couldn't have shown off uh, in the top level icons. So application bar icons. Application bar, bar icons should be, as you design these, should be very clear, understandable, and leverage real-world metaphors that are familiar to users. In the last segment, we talked about navigation graphics and infographics. This is where we got the inspiration for these. And the best icons have very simple geometric uh, shapes and limit the amount of fine detail. So it's something that should really because you can't really localize these in an easy way, the way you can localize text string to a different language or do globalization, um, try to use an icon that people across the world are going to understand, even if the text has been translated. So here's a couple of app bar uh, how-tos. Use icon buttons for the primary most used actions in any application. If there's something that's getting used day to day and they're hitting it really quick, the, the app bar that rests at the bottom of the screen is the closest to their finger and thumb and is the fastest way for them to act on those items. The application uh, bar is perfect for this. Um, don't use four icons just to use them. Uh, it's very fun and cool little control at the bottom, but sometimes just because there's those four slots in there, you can use one, two, or three icons just as easily. And in a lot of times, less is more in this space. Uh, if you only have searching on a list, a very simple search icon it being the only thing in the app bar is fine. It works great. Um, and then use the user-defined system theme colors unless there's a compelling reason to override this. Later in this section, I'm going to talk about theming, how you can theme your entire application and how Windows Phone supports light, dark themes as well as accent colors. If you use the defaults, everything will work perfectly. The text will be legible. As soon as you start to tweak that, your use cases and the things that you're going to need to test uh, are going to go more and more and up and up. Uh, so by default, use the user theme defined theme colors, uh, the system defined theme colors if you can, um, but if you have a highly customized app, just put in the time to test it against light themes and dark themes. We'll get more to that in a second. Here's something else uh, that is great for the system. It's called Toasts, and it basically pops up at the top of the screen right here. You'll notice right next to the system tray, and a toast displays at the top of the screen to notify the user of an event such as news or a weather alert. An incoming text message also fires this up. Here's the anatomy of a toast. It basically has an app list icon. Every toast is correlated with an application. When an incoming text message comes in, it will have the text SMS icon. Uh, then there's text one, which is basically a bold text, and then the text to follow, which is content text. A text waits around for around 10 seconds, and one of the things that you can do to dismiss this text and just get rid of it is a swipe of your finger uh, to the right-hand side, and it will throw it off the screen. Here's a couple of quick little hints about working on them. Uh, to, to, toast links, they basically truncate and run right off the right hand side. side. You don't wrap the text in them, um, and this is a controversial decision, but very easy to read and legible as long as you limit it, your content inside it. With the title, approximately 40 characters can be displayed. Content only, then approximately about 47 characters can be displayed because you don't have that bold text on the left hand side. If a toast is split evenly between title and the content, then approximately 41 characters can be displayed. We've measured this out in the design studio. Keep your toast simple if at all possible. This is the kind of thing that's going to be bubbling up when someone's sitting in a meeting, driving in the car. We don't want them to be distracted at all. It's something that you should be able to glance and go. Any text that does not fit in the toast will be truncated on the right-hand side. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about if you need to throw up a bigger notification or a different alarm or reminder that's uh, larger than a toast notification, these don't need to be app specific. Whereas a toast, as soon as it pops up, you could click on it and it will 
open directly the app that it came from. Uh, this is basically anything that you can utilize in your application. It's a dialogue that pops up over the screen. There's two different ways to get rid of it, actually three. One would be to click anywhere off the outside of it. A back button press would also remove it, as well as if you just hit, if they give you any sort of dismiss dialog or buttons or UI on the thing, clicking that would also dismiss uh, the alarms or reminders. These things are great for if you have any sort of OK or cancel verification in your UI that you need to use, uh, but de by default, uh, text content is the best for them. Now lock screen. We've always had a lock screen on our phone, uh, but on Windows Phone 8, it is getting more beautiful, more customizable, and better for the app ecosystem. You can customize your lock screen to show upcoming appointments, new calls, text, updates from apps, and more, plus a pretty new picture as often as you like. Um, in the very center section of this, I'll break down the anatomy of a lock screen. You basically have the time and date. Over here, you have a detail or status, a big status, and then down here you have quick statuses, which are icons along the bottom. In the background, you have a background picture, and of course you have the system tray at the top that shows on the start screen and all the different apps. Um, but a user can now uh, customize this area and this right in here, detailed status, to define whether it's um, being used by different applications or they can choose which five applications it uses. Uh, the lock screen background, applications can now push out their own images into the lock screen background. This is something that we've exposed to third party applications and designers. So here's the default. Um, you basically, if you have this lock screen background, uh, you're going to need kind of to put your content in this area. Don't put text content in any underneath this text or it might be confusing. All of these graphics are overlaid with a slight layer of black with opacity on it. Uh, so that even if it's white, you'll be able to see this white text sitting on top of it. However, text over text is not legible. It gets very confusing to the user. So try to keep your areas. If you're using the WVGA resolution of 480 by 800, keep it to about 288 pixels by 288 pixels. If you're going all the way up to the HD 720p resolution, keep it about 432 uh, by 432. But mostly think top left-hand corner of the display area. So a couple of lock screen how-tos. Um, keep the logo and text small on the screen so it doesn't compete with the date, time, or notifications. Um, if you're including a logo, consider making it slightly transparent. Uh, this, is, this way it'll kind of sit nicely behind the overlay. If you choose to include text, it should relate directly to your image so that it's not confusing or competing with the text from all the other apps that are bub bubbling up content at that point in time. Uh, the visual focus of the lock screen image should be the image, not the logo or the text. So those five icons down at the bottom, the user decides. You really can't control whether or not they, which application they're going to bubble up to it. Also, the big status right directly above that, the user decides as well. If your application is defining the background, please keep these rules in mind and don't try to fight or compete with other apps in the ecosystem. It can make for a really messy thing and it will be the quickest way that they'll decide to turn off your application. Next, the context menu. We've already talked, talked about the application menu. The app bar down at the bottom is basically menu items for this entire screen. But what, how do you get to menu options on an individual list item or some single smaller piece of UI that's nested in that page? The way that we do that is with the context menu. Context menus are opened by a press and hold on any menu item. Uh, allow up to five menu items on a single UI element. So if you have email, you could do delete, mark as unread, move, set flagged. Um, and you can dismiss these guys similar to the app bar or similar to a notification by just clicking anywhere else or hitting the hardware back button. And that will get rid of it. Keyboards. Keyboards are also a system level thing. You'll think about these a little bit, but uh, by default in the shell, we've created some beautiful keyboards, award-winning keyboards for you to use. Windows Phone supports basically around eight different layout types for English. You can switch between textual layout types. You can switch between, um, oh sorry, numeric, textual, and then of course ones that would be specific for sending, putting an email address with an at and .com symbol in them. Um, you basically just need to set what the in input scope is on the different text box fields. In this way, you won't, all of these uh, different keyboards you can navigate to from the basic keyboard, meaning if you just got an alpha, 
numeric one. You could flip over to numeric numbers or special characters. However, if you give them the one that's tailored to them in that specific scenario, in that application, you're going to be that much better and your app's going to feel that much more native and thought through. Screen orientations. Uh, like most smartphones today, you can rotate a Windows phone and get different layouts. Uh, so by default, we have the portrait, and then we actually have two types of landscape. We have landscape to the right, and we have landscape to the left. By default, portrait is sort of the default layout of panoramas and um, pivots and other sort of pages will work really well with landscape left and right. When you go landscape right, one of the things you'll notice, the app bar moves over to the left to be closer to your thumb over here on your left hand side and the system trays on the right. If you go landscape left, the uh, app bar will be on the right hand side and the system trays on the left. One of the things that you should think about and notice when you're designing an application, if you're designing a page that has uh, a system tray or an app bar at the top and bottom, when you go into landscape mode, that, that screen will be skinnier than if you did not have a system tray and a no, uh, um, system tray and an app bar sorry, uh, at the top and the bottom. So the resolution or the width will change on your application. Screen orientations. Uh, so this is when it flips. It's basically right around 60 degrees left, 60 degrees right. It'll flip up into portrait. Um, landscape left and landscape right. This is also the way that you'll see it. Um, there's no programmatic way to switch orientations on the phone. You basically just need to let the phone tell you when this is going to happen. Uh, you can also lock in a page that says, I'm not going to listen to orientations. I'm going to be default landscape left, default landscape right, or um, a, a portrait page. But other than that, you cannot fire off these events and pretend that the phone has done these things. Uh, so here's a couple of orientation how-tos. Avoid creating text input heavy landscape experiences. Text is really hard to read for a user if it's long in between wrapping. And when you go into portrait on a phone, you definitely have a longer view. And so when you're designing that application, make sure that you limit the length of that text when it wraps when you're in portrait mode. Another thing that I pointed out earlier, there's no programmatic way to switch orientations. And remember, um, system tray hidden uh, will affect the landscape width of your UI. So showing or hiding both the system tray or the app bar will affect that width when you're in landscape. <coughs> So that sort of wraps up our talk about all the shell different controls. The next thing I'm going to talk about is system level and kind of these uh, system level touches and gestures that you can use on the phone. These are pretty standard uh, across a lot of different products and everything at Microsoft. But uh, we're going to be talking a lot about specifics and implementation practices. First off, namely touch targets. Your app should present users with a touch target of ample size, big enough for your finger to hit. Users should get feedback that their taps have operated controls um, and have allowed them to make progress in your app. To these ends, Windows Phone has certain requirements about using touch. So when you're thinking about doing touch, um, there's a couple things that you need to take into account. You need to take into account the shape, the location that it's on screen, the frequency of that use, uh, the visual design, kind of the padding, um, and the way that it looks, kind of the opacity of it all, and then sort of your error consequences. If you miss that, are you accidentally going to hit another button that deletes it? Or if you miss that, are you going to just going to get to try again? If there's a lot of items slammed close together that all have functionality built into them, like a stack of buttons, you really want to think about the size of your hit targets. So first, let's start with a couple of rules. The minimum size of a hit target. You can't measure this in pixels, right? Because there's different size phones. We've got big phones, large phones, small phones. And then now, with Windows Phone 8, we actually have different resolutions. So the way that we measure these is actually in millimeters. The default smallest size that we want any hit target to be is 9 millimeters across. This is already baked into our default controls. You don't have to program this, but like our our whole system is customizable, so are hit targets on buttons. You could come in there and f uh, mess around with this and potentially make your app a little bit difficult to use. On our system, we have a couple of hit targets that are seven millimeters high. You're allowed to do this, we do this, but one of the rules that we try to get you to stand by, if it's a seven millimeter high hit target, make sure that it's a long and skinny hit target so that they can miss to the left and right. We find that this uh, improves usability 
And so uh, nine millimeters would be the default square, but if you're using a seven millimeter high one, please make it a rectangle. Uh, another thing uh, for negative hit targets is that your hit targets don't actually have to be the size of the visual object on screen. Uh, in Windows Phone, we use negative hit targets or negative hit margins. You may have heard these called. Um, in most cases, make the visual size equal to the touch target size, uh, but using spacing makes controls look easier to hit. So take into account sort of the visual spacing, the visual asset, the touch target, and the dead space when you're doing this. If you have a lot of space, make your hit target a little bit bigger. You never want it to be so big that someone tries to tap over here and accidentally hits your button, but you do want to make it big enough that if somebody is holding their phone and walking down the street and they tap and barely miss in those two or three millimeters on the left or right hand side, that they actually hit the button. And this way, we've improved the usability a lot on Windows Phone, and it feels like they're always hitting the button when sometimes they actually miss. So, small targets how-to. Make the target size bigger than the visual asset. Introduce space between uh, adjacent visual assets. Um, and we're all about white space on Windows Phone anyway, so if you're designing a, a Windows design language style phone, it shouldn't be a problem for you. Um, and then create a visual padding around the asset. So here's an example of this, the negative hit targets. Here's edit up in the top of a dialog. And then here's in a list. We've got a little padding and spacing in between, so you're not just bumping those icons right up next to each other. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about gestures. Input gestures are vital to Windows Phone because we're basically um, a touchscreen device. We have some hardware keyboards, but this is mostly the way that we interact with the device. This is pretty standard. It's a tap. A tap is just a single brief touch on the screen within a bounding area and back up again. It's not a tap if the finger comes down and moves slightly. That goes into a different gesture, but one of the most interesting things about tap gestures is that they actually have to come down and then come back up. As soon as you do anything else, it's engaged a totally different gesture. So it's basically the time down and the time up. So you'll notice that taps never engage really until that release. Um, so a finger down provides touch indication. Finger, finger up executes the command. A double tap. Double taps are not used very regularly on Windows Phone. One of the ways that they're used is in images to zoom in and out or on browsers to zoom in and out. In the image controls, we use them. And then also in the web browser control that you're provided with to design your own applications, you have use of this. So you can double tap. You also have this control to use in your own way, right? This gesture is something that we've programmed in. So you could write your own functionality around it. We just ask that you kind of use it in lines with the way that we're always already using it. Next, a pan. I mentioned this earlier. A pan is a single finger down, and if your finger doesn't come right back up and do a, a tap right then, then you are in the panning gesture. Um, and, or actually, if it moves, if it begins to move across the screen. So a, a pan is a single finger placed down and moved across the screen in any direction. The pan gesture ends when the finger is lifted, and usually this does not make the UI glide after it. What usually makes the UI glide is a flick. This is a much faster gesture that moves quickly across the screen and then lifts up. A flick is a single finger down moved rapidly in any direction and ends with the finger up. The math between a pan and a flick is pretty complicated, so I'm not going to explain it to you because I don't quite get it. Um, but basically, you can use these two interactions for two totally different things. It's very common for us to resort things with a pan, like a list, but when you're flicking it, it just moves you rapidly through that list. Um, flicks are very common for moving the entire UI and a whole canvas. Pinch and stretch. Pinch and stretch is two fingers down within separate bounding areas, followed by the fingers either moving in or out. Um, and so one of the regular things is when you do a stretch, it will blow up the content. When you do a pinch, it'll zoom back down the content. A touch and hold. Touch and hold is a single finger down, like a tap that just stays there. Um, this is commonly used and definitely used on our start screen to begin editing things. So in any sort of uh, context menu scenarios, a press and hold like this will bring up a menu and give you additional options. On the start screen, a press and hold like this will actually throw everything into edit mode and allow you to resort the live tiles on start screen. So here's a couple of gesture how-tos. 
you have up to four touch points and maybe more depending on the hardware for Windows Phone. You can create your own, but we don't make it super easy for you. It's very easy for you to use the can gestures that are already implemented in the system. Um, and then the last couple of things, performance tune-up applications that support more than two simultaneous touch endpoints to ensure application performance doesn't suffer. Whenever you're tracking multiple things across the UI, um, this applies to animations and everything, you're really going to need to start thinking about performance because you're only using a phone. It's not like desktop hardware. Uh, this run uh, summarizes up and ends up, <laughs> finishes up the talk about Windows Phone 8 system. Next, we'll be talking about composition controls and APIs. See you then. Welcome back to Designing for Windows Phone 201. I'm Jared Potter, and right now, last section, we talked about the system. Next, we'll be talking about composition, and then we'll be talking, lastly, about controls and API. This is composition. Let's jump right in. So I've broken composition up into three different departments. There's visuals, there's layouts, and then on Windows Phone, we're big and heavy on motions and transitions. We love motion and transition, as well as the visuals. The biggest, one of the biggest pieces of the visuals for Windows Phone that everybody sort of realizes and talks about is that customization piece. Um, how beautiful it is and how you can really reorder that start screen using line, live tiles and make it your own. Another thing that you can do is theming. And this theming goes across the entire product and also filters down into third party applications. The applications that you're working on can completely utilize this to make their applications bigger and better. Pardon me. Um, by default, out the door, you have light theme and dark theme. But on Windows Phone 8, you have a whole plethora of accent brushes. You have multiple accent brushes. I think you have 20 canned accent brushes coming out the gate. And depending on what provider and manufacturer that you have, you may even have more than this. So here's a breakdown of sort of the colors. These are the default shipping ones that come out the, go the gate. And then depending on who your manufacturer is, they may have added two or three. They don't really remove from this list. But here's the red, green, blue values. You can find this all up on windowsphone.com, as well as which phone these are going to be available on. These are really important things to test against. So uh, the visual themes filter down into your applications in a lot of ways. All the default controls that you're going to be provided with to design your applications with, whether that be buttons or checkboxes, radio buttons, all of them take whether it's light theme, dark theme, and most of them put the accent brush in it too. In addition to that, the live tiles that are on the start screen use alpha composite. They're PNGs with an alpha channel in them, allowing you to, the, you to overlay them over the default accent brush. This allows you to make your application feel very much like a default application on the start screen that you saw here. There's tons of applications with icons. These are PNGs with an alpha layer around them, and you can see the accent brush coming through there. A couple of theme how-tos when you're working on these. Always check your apps in light theme or dark theme. I can't say how many times I've designed an app and it looks really beautiful, but I've been working solely in Photoshop on the dark theme, and then I've been testing it on the device solely on the dark theme because that's my personal favorite. As soon as I switched to light theme, I realized the developer or myself had hard-coded some of the text to actually be uh, white text sitting on a black background. As soon as the background becomes white, that text just disappears. Make sure that even your text in the front ground as well as your backgrounds are using theming and they'll both inverse properly. If you are utilizing the system's themes, use a basic color scheme. Most of our colors that we picked for Windows Phone are pretty bright, vibrant colors that really pop out to the user. If you're competing with those in your own application, because the user can define which color that they have on Windows Phone, you never know which color is going to work with yours and which colors aren't. So we would like to encourage you, if you're going to go big on our accent brushes and our themes built into Windows Phone, uh, then use your uh, basic color scheme in your application. Also, don't be afraid to use accent brushes. They are a simple way to make your, your application feel very native to Windows Phone 8, as if it was an application developed in-house in the design studio and shipped out globally. People really love it when your phone feels like a part of the entire ecosystem. 
Another thing to, to point out in the visuals is the iconography. I mentioned this a little bit in the last section, uh, but some actions are very difficult to clearly convey with text and imagery. In these cases, use really simple geographic iconography instead of images or even text. Now, here's an example of this. In the case, in the, in the, his, in the past, Microsoft and other companies have been very known for very lush, plentiful, full color graphics and icons. Uh, but one of the things you'll notice if you look over here on the right hand side is that the more simple you get, the more generic an icon mean can can uh, the meaning of that icon can be. So if we look at this this house, this could be one specific house in the world, maybe two or three. If you look at this one, this might be a couple hundred houses in the world, and this house over here as it begins to get simplified down could probably stand for a couple thousand houses in the world. As we begin to remove items and elements and break it down to its basic shape, this icon right here could basically stand for almost 90% of the houses in the world. When we design our icons, we are thinking about worldwide adoption and scale. We're thinking that when this application shows up in a different country, we still want them to know what clock this is. This is the global clock, this is not a specific clock at that time. So, uh, the next thing is imagery on Windows Phone 8. Uh, Windows Phone is a big fan of imagery and how you incorporate it. We do it in the OS all the time. On panoramas, we have them in the background. In lists, we have them prominent in the tiles. We have them prominent also in live tiles as well as displayed in full display on lock screen. Uh, imagery in your applications can be used basically to your best interest. You can do them in multiple different ways. You can put them in in multiple different ways. Look at the way that we're implementing them on it and kind of follow those rules. I have a couple of simple how-tos um, when it comes to icons and imageries. With the icons, go simple uh, and geometric, kind of reduce the visual elements and don't do a lot of gradients. Um, but when it comes to imagery, don't be afraid to go big, right? We have full scale backgrounds. We have the whole lock screen. Make a whole background color. Just make sure you have enough contrast for the content to stand out and pop off of that. We really are a big fan of white space and using the rules of figure and ground when you're designing an application. Layer your imagery with content. So if you have imagery, one of the things you'll notice are live tiles are layered over gra are, are layered over images. Our panoramas are layered over images. Our uh, lock screen is also layered. So don't be afraid to do some layering. Layer your imagery with content with imagery, and just don't go too deep with it. Here's a personal thing that I've worked on for a lot of it. Export. Uh, your images to a 16-bit color space. So you won't find this in any of the documents, but this is a personal hint. Uh, Windows Phone uh, compresses all of your images from 24-bit to 16-bit. It may look really great in the emulator, it may look really great in Photoshop, but as soon as you get it in, and if it's got a gradient in it, you might start to notice little compression banding. A good way to get, that, get rid of that is in Photoshop, Fireworks, whatever your default design program is, when you're saving out a gradient, a background gradient. I just designed an application that had the sky in it and it had a, a dark blue all the way to a black gradient in the background. Just add a little bit of noise in Photoshop or Fireworks to prevent sort of that banding where you see the compression happening and it will look smooth and buttery in the background. It's a good simple trick to make your imagery and your icons pop when you're designing a Windows Phone 8 application. Next, fonts. These are sort of the default canned fonts that come on Windows Phone. You probably, if you've been working on Windows Phone for any amount of time, you've probably heard of Sego WP. Sego WP is our font. It comes in five basic uh, um, uh, font widths. We've got semi-light, regular, semi-bold, black, um, as well as light that I don't have listed up there. We also have bundled with it a standard set of East Asian fonts as well as Chinese standard, Japanese, Korean. They're also included so that you can use those characters by default and it will do um, sort of nice uh, um, fonts and typography for you without you having to embed your own fonts and typography for Japanese or Chinese characters. Mm. Developers can embed their own fonts for use within an application. Um, I do this regularly. This is definitely, there's time, good times to use this and bad times to use this. One, with custom fonts, use custom fonts to showcase your own brand uh, in a very personal and a very positive way. 
And one of the things that works out very nicely on Windows Phone is if your main fonts, here's a great example, the New York Times does this, right? Um, or this style dependent font. One of the things that the New York Times does really nicely is they use their font for the headers, but then they use the Sago for the default body text. Here's an example where they actually use a serif font and they use it for the title as well as the content. So here's a couple of fonts how to. Avoid using font sizes that are smaller than 15 point. We do all the sizing and dealing with the resolutions when it comes to your applications. If you make anything smaller than 15 point font, it doesn't matter how big the screen is or how high the resolution is, it's going to be very difficult for the human eye to read. So please stick to a 15 point uh, font or larger and really 17 is also, I mean it's kind of the real minimum, but 15 is an absolute minimum. If you're using colored fonts, uh, use high contrast colors at small point sizes to enhance readability. So if you've got colored fonts and you've got small, fonts, uh, small font sizes, make sure that it's not similar to the background color that it's overlaying. If they're almost the same, then it's going to be very difficult to read, especially with the, what I mentioned before, the small point, uh, point sizes as well as um, uh, color, the color on them. Since Sago is an integral part of the UI experience, use alternative fonts sparingly in your applications. Just use them for your brand. Don't go completely nuts with them. Use them with a purpose. And then one of the things that I'd like to point out personally, when you have colored fonts or you're using accent brushes on fonts, make sure that you test your fonts and layouts in both themes. Go to light theme, dark theme, and especially if you have an accent brush like hyperlinks on fonts, Always make sure you test it against a couple of the different accent brushes, especially things like yellow that don't feel as contrasty um, as sitting on top of white. Yellow on white, you can lose the type a lot. So one of the things that I always recommend people when I see typography that's been themed or fonts that have been using the theme color, always check it against all the different theme colors, especially yellow on Windows Phone. Next, globalization and localization. Windows Phone 8 provides a lot of this for you. This is really in the dev details. I can't get too much into this. A lot of it isn't things that I have to deal with in the design studio that much. Um, but bi-directional layouts are totally taken care of or mostly taken care of for users. We flip uh, the UI for uh, right to left reading and basically we unflip everything that's like an image so that all the images aren't mirrored and looking uh, incorrect. We also have East Asian vertical text built into those builds. So if you're um, in Japan or, or China, you may see some vertical text, as well as localization for strings. So we have um, built-in buffer space, a room, around each of the strings um, that you can actually swap it out for a different language. One of the rules of thumb, if you're designing uh, you're an English designer using American English. One of the things you might want to leave like 40% buffer space for all of your typography. Localizing to different languages like German and things like that, some of their characters tend to be a little bit longer um, than American English. So that completes visuals. Next we're going to talk a little bit about layout and designing a page. Hopefully that answers some of your visual questions. So first, the biggest question on Windows Phone 8 about layout is resolutions. Windows Phone now supports three major resolutions that you're going to see on the phones in your pockets. One, we have WVGA, which is 480 by 800, which is basically a 15 by 9 aspect ratio. We have WXGA, which is 768 uh, by 1280. And we have 720p, which is uh, HD basically, um, and it's 720 by 1280, and the aspect ratio on this one is slightly taller. One of the things to note on 720p is that applications that haven't been converted to this from the old 7.5 applications will actually have a slight black strip up along the top because the applications will sit in the WXGA location on those applications. Next, here is sort of the breakdown of the resolutions um, and how we handle it from Windows Phone 7.1 um, in, in the SDK. So WVGA, which is what we always had, 480 by 800, is a 15 by 9 aspect, aspect ratio, and um, there's basically no scaling, right, that happens. For WXGA, which is 768 by 1280, we basically do a 1.6 scale on it to accommodate for that new size. And 720p, we basically do a 1.5 scale 
Uh, it's a little bit 80 pixels taller and you'll be able to handle for that or account for that in your Windows Phone 8 applications. But if it's just a ported over 7.5 application, you'll notice that black strip up along the top. Here's a couple of things to note when you're designing as a designer uh, for uh, multiple resolutions. To display a splash screen for all different resolutions. Um, there are some helpers out there that are great that will grab the right size images for you. You might want to check out windowsphone.com to see those. Here's something that's actually built into the SDK. To display, to display a splash screen for all resolutions, use a single image file named splash screen image JPEG that's 768 by 1280 and it will handle all the resolutions for you. If you want different graphics for each of the resolutions, do this, do the splash screen dot uh, screen image dot screen dash wvga dot jpeg or wxga and put those all in the root folder. These graphics have to be in the root folder or they're not going to show up as your splash screen. Another thing to note, all splash screen images need to be in the root folder, just said that. Um, if you can't use a graphic for each user resolution, use a graphic for the highest resolution. So this is kind of a rule by, of thumb. The best case scenario is when you can have different graphics for every resolution. So on the lower resolution graphics, you're not hitting the load and performance of these uh, images that are basically twice as big as the screen or 60% uh, bigger than the screen. Um, and on these uh, large screens, you really want the graphics to pop, right? You don't want the smallest resolution and to actually see some pixelation in there. But if you can't, uh, it's better to fault on the side of actually seeing crisp, clear graphics and images. Um, so get those in there uh, at the large resolution. Next thing that I'm going to talk about is the grid. I, I, talked a little bit briefly about this in the last section when we were talking about design inspiration and composition of a page. And this was sort of generic design principles that we held to very strongly on Windows Phone. Um, but the grid system, this is a great quote by Joseph Mueller Brockman, the grid system is an aid, not a guarantee. It permits a number of possible uses and each designer can look for a solution appropriate to his personal style. But one must learn how to use the grid. It is an art that requires practice. So what I'm going to do in the grid section, obviously I can't take you to, to art school and teach you everything about using a grid and designing a grid. I have to take it for granted that you did that yourself and that you're already a professional designer and you're really excited about creating a Windows Phone application. But I am going to talk you through how we used the phones and how Jeff Fong and the creative team um, sort of came up with a grid that worked all across, both from Windows Phone 7 all the way up through Mango and the grid that they're still using. Grid, in a lot of ways, enhances usability too. There was a usability study um, done years ago and it was by uh, Ben Gurion at the University of Negev um, and it was basically set out some numbers in a grid and then the next study that they did on those same numbers they just basically reordered them and then moved one item out of the grid. Just by moving things out of the grid uh, just that little bit. The usability on it went incredibly down. And so you can highly improve usability on your applications by just by making things seem simple, seem like they're nicely ordered, um, and it will bring simplicity to your whole app and hopefully streamline usability as well. So here's the phone or, or the layout for uh, the WVGA the screen that we had to start with in Windows Phone 7. We started out by designing a grid and coming up with grid lines. We basically had a wide then thin, wide then thin column and row layout for our grid. This allowed us to create content spaces uh, where we wanted to fill in content. It allowed us to create multiple columns on the grid as well as multiple rows on that grid. All of our UI then would be able to fall into these content areas. But the nice thing about having an even and odd grid like this was that we could have two columns or we could have three columns of data. You could also use four columns or break this up back into the full column thing and you'll see how this plays out on the UI. Then we would come at screens like the People Hub and everything would pull ni fall nicely into our grid. But the grid was also flexible for custom screens like the album artwork so we put that up against the grid and we measured every single pixel so that everything felt very ordered. These are all very complex screens with lots of different data, but just by adding the order of the grid, it begins to simplify it down. Next, we started thinking about the lists and the, the way that the lists interacted with the grid. This is with large graphics, and so it's a little bit more straightforward. But as you notice, as our items began to scale down in our headers, everything still fit nicely into the grid that we had defined from the beginning. 
The next step was kind of adding text to that list. And even more text, when it's just completely a text base, they still align nicely to the grid, giving it that order and simple beauty. Uh, it started playing out in screens like the start screen, where you notice the lists are the exact same, but they're only just moved over basically one grid column, or two if you're looking at the content containers. And on Windows Phone 7 and 7.5, you saw this play out on the start screen, right? But in Windows Phone 8, we decided to redesign the start screen. We decided to add more live tiles and go from the edge to the edge, but that didn't break the grid. The grid was able to be flexible and actually uh, our content was able to be flexible to that grid and lay out beautifully and nicely in that grid. So here's a couple of grid how-tos. I can't tell you how to use the grid. You can go online to windowsphone.com and then the design page and download these grid samples. These are all in helpers that you can use for designing your own Windows Phone applications. But here's a couple of quick rules. Use order to create the perception of simplicity. We realize that your application is not actually simple, that you've got data calls coming in, tons of different content, tons of different menu items. But if you put it all in a nice layout using our controls, our system tray, and our app bar, we have done put a lot of user research and a lot of work into trying to create a system that will be simple and functional for the user. Two, establish a rhythm and a cadence with your grid. You could go to town and sort of lay everything all over the place, uh, but uh, if you do that, the rhythm and cadence across the entire UI will begin to get broken up and it will feel like a different application that's not native to Windows Phone 8. The last thing, you can break the grid or bend the grid to make it your content pop a little bit. We do this very little. We do this on the start screen. We do this a little bit on um, uh, the lock screen, but uh, once you've got a really nice grid, there's an example. I don't want to go into this too much because I don't know what your final UI will be like, but once you've got a great established grid, the best way to make any piece of content is pop it right outside of that grid. All right, so that's all I have for grids, but we'll go on to the, how this works on the individual layouts and the pages. So I mentioned this before. This is the status bar. Here's your application space menu bars and application bar. Now we're going to be talking mostly about this application space. We've already spent a good portion of our time talking about the system, which included like the system tray, the application bar. Hopefully you guys have a great grasp of that at this point in time and you want to know what to do with your application space or your pages. Firstly, one of the page templates that we provide that everybody seems to love is panoramas. Panoramas are supposed to be expansive and explorative. They're supposed to be, give you an overview of a lot of different data. It's basically like a giant magazine full out where you wanted to see all of this different information and now you can just glance. The actual screen size is only this big and so you can only see a portion of this. What we want you to feel like is that the screen is actually bigger than just the limitations of your phone. That you can pan through and look at multiple items all at once. Here's a couple of rules when it comes to uh, panoramas. One, when you're working with panoramas, uh, they are not virtualized. So you need to want, limit all the items that you have in your panorama or else the performance might go down. You also have background images. So um, one of the things to remember when you're, or a couple of things to remember when you're thinking about panoramas is that they're an expansive overview, right? Keep them to five items or less. Uh, because they're not virtualized and that data can slow down really, really fast. Um, so on your numbers of pain, probably like three or four is ideal when you're working with a panorama. Um, uh, another thing for panoramas, top level. Nothing but data and navigation. Don't put a lot of controls in here. If you have a timer app that times you're running and jogging that you're designing, a panorama is probably the not, not the best place to do it. Also, don't use controls or functionality to move you through the panorama. All of the navigation through a panorama should be finger input. Don't have a button hit over here fire you into a different pane. It's very disorganizing and kind of a jarring experience when it forces you to navigate on a panorama. Um, so top level, nothing but data and navigation. Next, number three, use a minimized app bar no system tray. You can use a system tray. We started using one in Office on Windows Phone 8, um, as well as portrait only. Portrait only is an absolute must. You, uh, panoramas don't really work when it goes into landscape mode. They need to be uh, sort of in the vertical portrait mode that you'll notice right here. 
<coughs> Panoramas are not virtualized and work best if containing five panels or less. Uh, returning users should be taken back to the pane where they left off. This is a big part of the history stack. This is a big part of navigation, but not just when you're using the history stack. If you're on the People Hub uh, on Windows Phone 8 and you leave that People Hub by going to the Start screen, navigate somewhere else, and then hit the People Hub again, you will go back to the last pane you were on. It's very important in this experience that we leave them where they are. Uh, sometimes users only use one or two panes out of a panorama, and we don't want them to be forced to scroll through panes that they don't use. Here's a couple of great uses of a panorama. I don't know if you've seen this. Here's just the visible area, but this is the Facebook application that's currently on the device. And another really beautiful use of a panorama is on the Kindle app today. Their background is gorgeous. They bubble up all the books that you're currently reading, and you can always go search and find more, and I love it. The next is the pivots. Pivots are basically a way to look at a data set on different pivots on a data set. Uh, panoramas are a kind of an overview look of everything, where pivots are kind of more of a navigation system, and a visual structure can be used uh, to navigate, to look at different forms on a data, such as an email when you look at either unread or flagged email or brand new email that's just came in. It's all the same data, but it's just different pivots on that data. A pivot control provides a quick way to manage views within the application. Pivot controls can be used for filtering large data sets, viewing multiple data sets, switching applications views, or related content. The pivot control places them horizontally next to each other and manages the left to right navigations with a flick or a pan to the individual pages. Gesturing left and right to the page advances the pivot experience regardless of what controls are on the page. This is another interesting thing to note. Both in pivot and panorama, it's important not to put two much gesture-based controls inside of them. None in the panorama, but in the pivot, don't put a slider control in a pivot because if you slide left and right on the slider control, you won't be able to pivot left and right. These are basically tabs that go from item to item. Next, pivots are virtualized. So this basically means when you're looking at this pivot item, it's loaded up, and then you load the one to the left, and they load the one to the right. So you can have multiple, multiple items in a pivot, and it's not going to slow down on you and get unperformant. So this is a big thing to think about whenever you're designing an application or dealing with technical obstacles is the performance of that item. Any pivot items outside of this are not um, loaded up into the memory at all. But one thing to note, you don't want your user to get lost. So the human brain, the reason phone numbers in the US are seven digits long is because that's what a human brain remembers. Try not to make your pivots more than seven items wide. You can still get lost even though it'll load in fast, it'll be super performant. Don't put more than seven items in a pivot just for the human brain's ability to deal with all that data. All right, here's a couple of pivot how-tos. The pivot control should be used only to display items or data, data of similar type. So don't use it with all kinds of different crazy controls from one page to the other. Use a full page, uh, a full app bar, and then also show the system tray. I, we always want you to show the system tray as much as possible. The only time it's a, even a question in our default system is in a panorama. But um, Try to definitely in this scenario, if you can, use, use the system tray up at the top so that you know what the time is that you can show the battery life at any given point. Contain seven items or less. This is just for the human mind. Um, never place a pivot control inside another pivot control or never place a pivot control inside of a panorama control. These aren't meant to be nested. Another thing to, to note on that, just don't put controls that require gestures inside of them too because they're going to get confusing to the user. One, they're going to try to be using the slider and the pivot will work or vice versa they'll be trying to use the pivot and they'll accidentally hit the slider. Uh, limit pivot header text to a maximum of one or two words. Uh, this is just because pivot header text gets truncated and you don't want to lose whatever that data is. Number six, never use an edit control within a pivot. That goes back to what I was saying earlier. Just use it for data sets. Drill down to single pages for anything that's got a lot of control in it. Here's a couple of great examples of pivots out there. Nike Plus. 
Um, it's got the Connect training in it. This is a completely customized pivot, but it is a pivot control, and you can flip through these items just like a pivot control. They've taken out the headers. They've used big, beautiful images instead of header text, but it's a beautiful, completely customized pivot control, and it shows you the capability of styling and putting your own brand into a Windows Phone 8 application. Next is a Sudoku application. They've kept the header and the title text along the top, but you can see this is also a completely revisited, restyled, different background uh, pivot that's really fun to do. The next thing that I'd like to talk about that the design studio at Windows Phone has not talked enough about is just the basic page. We always talk about pivots. We always talk about panoramas. And my biggest feedback when I go on the road and see people designing these applications is that they use pivots and panoramas too much. They stuff controls in them. They stuff pivots inside of pivots. And one of the things that gets frustrating to the user is when the interactions aren't exactly what they guessed they would be. So don't be afraid to use a basic page. A good rule of thumb is if you're in a game, a lot of the times you can use a basic page. Here's a great example. It's like a photo manipulation application, and they've decided to not do it, stick it in a pivot. It would have been very easy for them to put these options in a pivot, but they decided it was much better for the user to have a menu at the top. And then, of course, uh, locally to us, our audio, we could have put this music and all the different options in a pivot or a panorama, but it's just not the correct use. Don't be afraid to use a basic page and just your own design. Our controls are great. They make your app feel like a native application, but you don't have to use them in every scenario. So next, the last thing we're going to talk about is motion and transitions. There's a lot to cover in motions and transitions. I'll tra try to make it as tangible as possible. But the first thing, let's just talk about what motion adds to your application and what it adds to any application or any ecosystem. Motion delights the user. Motion is really exciting and fun, and it, add, it, it also adds a hint towards what the interaction is. This is a really good way, if there's actually two different hit targets, there's something in motion that we'll talk about, one of the transitions that we call turnstile feather, where we animate the items in one at a time on Windows Phone. This hints at the interaction that each one of these can be clicked separately, and they're different hit targets. Motion gives the impre uh, impression of enhanced performance. Most of the time, Windows Phone applications load faster than our competitors. Sometimes they're equal, and in other cases, the very rare times, they might even load slower. In those times, we've actually done usability tests against some of our major competitors, and the user still feels like Windows Phone apps load faster because they're never just sitting and waiting for the application to load. It's spinning in. It's the old application is dropping out. And even though it was 0 0.001 of a second slower than our competitor, it felt faster to the user. And what it felt like is the most important thing. Motion adds personality. If an application bounces in, it feels one way. If it snaps into place, it's a completely different feel. Uh, motion adds consistency. You can create your own motion, but across our ecosystem, I'll talk about the default motion that we put on Windows Phone, and we're consistent with that on the way that it's used, where it's used, how it's used, and it makes it feel like there's real physics involved and that you're living in a real world. And lastly, motion adds elegance. Um, some may say this is debatable or not, but I think the motion on Windows Phone gives it a little bit of class and it feels awesome. Another thing to point out, said so there was a lot to absolve here, or <laughs> to dissolve. Uh, Windows Phone is a movie. Uh, but a, a couple points about this. It's, it's about the content. It's really not about how you got there. And when you're, when you're doing animation and motion in an application, an action movie is not 100% action, unless you're Michael Bay. In that case, don't get me started. He thinks it's all about action. But the best action movies are when action is interspersed throughout great points in the movie, right? So we have high, which are defining moments. And maybe this is start screen and lock screen for us. Then we have lows, consistent but not distracting, still delightful. Little moments that they're going to see when they're checking their email day in, day out, day in, day out. And they don't need to be these highs, these big, beautiful motions that are in your face. But they need to be consistent and still delightful but we don't want them to take up too much time. Um, and then how it is edited is for the biggest impact. Like how do these motion all sort of work together? Each animation is part of the system and no animation should stand out as different. Each animation serves a purpose and gets out of the way quickly. That's really important. Animation appears in 2.5 dimensions on Windows Phone. We actually 
are not using real 3D on it. We're using a perspective 3D, and you can use this in your applications where we basically take 2D objects and we spin them in 3D, which is called 2.5D. We don't make use of elaborate textures, lightings, or extrusions on our items. Um, and for example, the tilt animations don't reveal any depth behind a touch target, only a flat surface. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how transitions work in your Windows Phone applications. They're triggered by a user action. Um, it transitions provide a mental breadcrumb for the user as they navigate the UI, basically meaning when I hit that back button, I should go to the last point, there was an animation. When I hit it again, there should be, I should go to the last animation, to the last animation. They're basically little stop gaps that the user can constantly rely on as the last place. So there's four different ways that you go into and out of a page. There's forward into an app, and then there's backward into an app, meaning you've gone beyond that app and you're coming backward. There's forward out of an app, so first forward into an app, then forward out. And then there is backward into an app, meaning hitting the back button and going in, and backward out of an app. All, every single page on Windows Phone's navigations are animated in these four different ways. There's either forward in, forward out, backward in, and backward out. Think about all your applications in those contexts. So, here's a couple of rules, actually a lot of rules, about transitions. One, establish physics. We do this by forward in, forward out, backward in, backward out. A sense of gravity works on the device that the user can relate to, right? This is the digital world. Nothing, none of the rules of the real physical world actually apply. So when we started working on and designing Windows Phone and when you're designing your application, create a sense of the real world, actual physics, actual gravity, things snapping into place, objects having uh, their own uh, weight and size. Gravity is always the same, so should the phone. Uh, transitions are directional, and this is what I was talking about with in and out. Make sure that when you enter, exit, forward and backward, create the mental of mode of where items live. You want them to feel like items exist in certain places, even when they're loaded away. They've swung out of the way to the left, they swung out of the way to the right, but when they click and go back into that item, it's a very subtle thing. Most users don't understand it when they use a Windows phone, they just know it's delightful. Um, if it didn't change, don't move it. So this is a great rule for live tiles. Don't just animate a bunch of stuff if you don't have new data. Same with your applications. Just, just don't start f firing off animations like left and right. If you're doing data visualization, animate them when the data loads in. But if the data is not changing, don't constantly fire animations on those items. Don't like animate the colors from one to another if no data is changing. So here's a couple rules about delighting. One, easing, bring it on. So, I don't know if you can see here, but as this guy comes in, he comes in faster and slows down as he snaps into place. This is how we do it on the default. It's called a logarithmic animation. If an object is entering the screen, it uses a log logarithmic uh, easing, sliding in to a nice easy stop. Comes in fast, stops really slow. So, if that is too jarring, like if you're animating something across the entire screen, use an S-curve. So the, uh, a motion designer will know these pretty handily in their toolkit, uh, but when the logarithmic easing feels too jarring, S-curve easing can be used for larger moves on the screen. Now the next thing is when you get rid of it. When you get rid of it, start fast and then slow down. So this is the exact opposite of the others. I don't know if you can pick it up on that screen, but it's the exact opposite. When you're loading something in, have it fly in really fast and snap into place. Um, and then slow down as it snaps into place so that you get an uh, idea of what it looks like. But when you're getting rid of something, have it fly off super fast. This is called an exponential. If an object is leaving the screen, it uses an exponential easing, which builds tension and then quickly flies the object off. Next, here's a couple of the motion basics that we use on the phone. We provide in toolkits. Um, and that you can use. So this is old samples, but it's been the exact same since Windows Phone 7. This is the first one, it's called a turnstile. And turnstile is basically when the items pivot based on the edge of the screen and loop to the next item. The next animation is called a continuum. Continuum is when you click something on the list and it carries up and around into the next page. Here comes the name and it's less left this list and now it's in the title. It carries through one piece of, uh, of the UI from one screen into the next screen to say, all right, you clicked on Dinara, 
and Dinara is also now the thing that you're going to see. Um, that's what we call a continuum on Windows Phone 8. Next, there's a swivel. Uh, a swivel um, is basically a dead end kind of animation. It's used for modals, for dialogues, things like that. If you're coming to select some options, a swivel flips in, and then just as easily when you tap it, it swivels and flips out. So this should be for some very light uh, end notifications, dialogues, these kind of things. Use a swivel in all of these scenarios. On Windows Phone, you may have not have thought about it before, but if you look at the screens, this is how we use it. Next and last, dead end full page screens, a slide. When you click on something, the menu slides up. There's nothing beyond that. But just that screen, you can select it and go back, but it basically just slides into place. It's supposed to just feel like it's overlaying the previous content. Now, those were, in the last couple of slides, we were covering transitions. And transitions are basically animations to go from one page to the next. But what about other animations that aren't just transitions in between pages? So animations, visual feedback combined to a local element within a view, but not always as a result of a user action. Mostly, this either has to be based on a user action or data on your screen changing, right? One example is the lock screen's hop motion, which informs the user how to unlock. These are great examples of when you're doing some motion, try as best as you can to hint towards what an interaction would be. As you animate items in and animate them out, animate data in, create a sense of physical space, layer on top of the basic system, illustrate brand and user journey thoughtfully and with purpose, and content is still the focus, not how you get there. So all these uh, animation things are not the goal, they're just kind of the spice that makes it that much better. Make sure your animations serve a purpose. So here is a couple of motion how-tos. It doesn't matter how long an animation takes. It matters how long you think it takes. So the user needs to feel like these are quick, snappy animations. If they're seeing them over and over and over again, they'll get frustrating. Under 500 milliseconds for the human user, it feels instant. So never have an animation that's longer than that. The difference between a really senior motion designer is snappy animations and a really junior motion designer who thinks their work is amazing is these long, slow animations where things kind of fly out and flutter and land on the page. Uh, that is too much for the user and it will become frustrating over time. Use easing to your advantage. This delights. This is what I was talking about before. Rather than having something move directly across the screen in a linear way and just stop, have it come in faster and slow down or leave slower and then fly out, um, but use that easing. Uh, not what you thought you saw, and for time-consuming processes, use animation feedback. So if something's loading, if something is taking too much time, it's very frustrating to the user if they feel like they don't know when it's going to end. It could only be seven seconds or five seconds, but if they feel like it's frozen and it's not happening, it's not giving you any motion feedback, then they feel like it's frozen. Just throwing in a simple progress bar in its indeterminate state or providing your own animation will relieve all that stress for the user. So that completes our composition piece where we talked about the visuals and layouts, the grid systems, and the page templates. Next we did layout, and then lastly we followed up with motion and transitions. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jared Potter, and we're talking about designing for Windows Phone 201. In this section, we've talked about the system, uh, the composition of Windows Phone pages, and now lastly, we'll be talking about the controls available to you and the APIs. Uh, in this section, I've broken it down into controls, of course, and, of course, the APIs. And lastly, we'll finish up with actually putting a little bit of UI on the device with some prototyping with those controls and with those APIs. So, first thing I should talk about, which is probably the most simple thing and the thing that you're going to see throughout your apps, our apps, everyone's apps, is button, right? There's a couple different types of button. There is the standalone push buttons. There are toggle buttons provided to you, which are actually a different control. So if you're using them, toggle buttons actually have the state of selected or unselected. We have application bar icons, which we talked about when we talked about the application bar and sort of the shell level buttons. Um, we also have 
dialog buttons that you'll see up here, as well as command buttons that allow you to edit the templates and put more content in them and sort of edit them that much more. Uh, button how to's is the button control should never include more than two words. Uh, this is a simple thing, but also remember when I was talking earlier today, we were talking about sort of localization and globalization. If your application is going to be localized and globalized and you're going to change those strings out to a different language, you always want to leave 40% buffer in there. So that's one rule, but the second rule is just try to keep your buttons to less than two words. You wouldn't want to have a whole bunch of text to make it difficult. Usually, um, uh, you usually just want to use a verb like OK, cancel. Always use the system fonts unless brand guidelines tell you to use another font. So by default, our systems uh, and our buttons have been used and utilized with the default fonts. You can style that and control that as much as you want, but it's the default. Uh, button control text should be concise and typically a verb. I kind of mentioned this. OK, cancel. And the last thing, button control text may be dynamic. So you're allowed to make this dynamic, populate, edit, uh, things like that. But uh, the next thing that we're going to look a little bit at is checkboxes. Checkboxes are generally used and left out of anything but a setting screen for us on Windows Phone 8. You can use the checkbox control in groups to display multiple choices from which the user can select one or more. The checkbox control is similar to the radio button control in that each is used to indicate a selection that is made by the user. They differ in only one radio button in a group of buttons can be selected at a time. Where checkboxes, you can do multi-select. Multi-select is built into a lot of the lists. Like an email, if you tap the far left-hand side of the screen, you'll be able to multi-select checkboxes and delete multiple emails at once. In a couple of different scenarios, like in the photo galleries, there's actually a multi-select icon down at the bottom of the screen that shows the checkboxes. These are two totally acceptable ways to show and hide checkboxes on lists that aren't in setting screens. So a couple of checkboxes how to. Checkbox controls can be used to change the availability or state of other dependent UI elements in the same way. So you could say uh, save password and then turn on and off a password box. Uh, always use the system font unless brown guidelines specify you otherwise. We always kind of give that recommendation when it comes to controls that are built into the system. Uh, next, uh, we recommend that you limit text for a checkbox control to either one or two lines. So in buttons, we just say no more than two words. In checkboxes, you can actually have a line of text after it. Click that, and it will also check the checkbox. Uh, but we recommend that you limit it to one or two lines. Otherwise, use a radio button or a list control. If there's going to be a ton of, uh, uh, a ton of text, maybe checkbox isn't the right thing for you. Uh, if there are several choices to present, uh, consider using a scroll viewer control adding a stack panel. So be able to scroll through the content either vertically or horizontally, usually vertically. Try to avoid the use of indeterminate state. So indeterminate state means it is neither checked or unchecked. It has not been term determined yet. A lot of times the user will think that that means that it is unchecked. So try to avoid using the indeterminate state on a checkbox. If this is the case, maybe you should be using a different control like radio button. Uh, but it seems to be one of the more confusing states and never tests well when you test it with real users and user research. Hyperlink button. The hyperlink button control looks and operates just like a conventional web hyperlink. It consists of specially formatted text or an image that can be tapped to open a web view somewhere else in your app or mobile Internet Explorer. It can actually fire you out into Internet Explorer. It similarly looks just like this, but a couple of things and how-tos to remember. Don't make hyperlink button controls longer than a word or two. Don't replace hyperlink button controls close to each other. Doing so will make it really difficult. Remember why we said the minimum hit targets? Well, the minimum hit targets um, actually get even smaller when you're talking about 15 pixel fonts or 15 point font sizes. So it actually goes smaller than what we recommend to be the smallest hit target. So be really careful that you don't shove a bunch of these hyperlink buttons up next to each other. Don't display a hyperlink button control that's disabled and can't be enabled. This is a really frustrating thing. The disabled state isn't great for hyperlink buttons, and there's no really use case for this on the web why you would have a link that just didn't work. So don't use hyperlink buttons with disabled states. Buttons can have disabled states. Try not to use it with hyperlink button. 
use a disable state for the hyperlink button control only if the state is temporary. I still, even in this case, don't recommend it. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about the image control. This is leaning a little bit more towards technical implementation. Uh, earlier, we talked about imagery. And just all, in the visual section, we were talking about all of images and when and how to use these. Uh, one of the things to note, just really at a high level, the rules still apply to the imagery section that I was talking about earlier in the visual section, how to use image. But avoid pixelated images, and you'll notice like even in this picture, banding in the images, try to use some of that uh, add noise to get rid of banding, and then always note and realize that your pictures are going to get banded down to 16-bit instead of 24-bit. The size of an image control should sometimes depend on the content of that image. So always sort of think about the re relevant content that it's coming in, whether you're pulling in a Facebook feed full of images or different content, always be really cognizant of what the final product will be. Ink Presenter. This is fun if you're going to make an application for drawing or painting or doing anything like that. Ink Presenter basically controls and enables users to draw strokes and other elements, which makes, which makes it ideal for enabling users to draw on visual items such as editing pictures or even highlighting text. This is a control that we give to you. We allow you to use it. A lot of the controls in the list that I'm going through right now, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to use it in your application. My goal is kind of give you the design principles and say how we do it in the design studio, say how we think about things, how we brainstorm about things. Then I talk to you about the visuals and the way we do things. And then I'm just going to give you a list of how these controls and how they work and what the default things is and a couple of how to's. But ultimately, the design decisions are going to be up to you. And so we want to just give you the right amount of data around all this to make educated decisions when you're designing a Windows Phone 8 application. Next, radio buttons. Radio buttons were mentioned before when we were talking about checkboxes. But the only major difference with a radio button, if you're familiar with this uh, analogy on the web, is that only one in a group can be selected at a time. So if this is a group, only this one would be selected. You select here. The other one would unselect. Um, so. This is a couple of radio button how-tos. Intentionally draw the user's complete attention to an important set of options or choices. Uh, reserve your sort of illumination effects and animations for the selected state. You don't really want to have them all be different colors. Um, and the unselected state radio button controls should appear unused or kind of just sitting there waiting to be selected. Uh, make them appear in their own view when possible to avoid distracting the user from an important decision and to cut down on the clutter. Maybe have the text, they read the text, and then give them the very simple uh, options. Uh, and a part of that is just carry out some short, succinct labels for each title. Don't have it say like blah, 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 this and this and this, if you select this one. Kind of describe that earlier and then say yes or no on your, check or on your radio buttons. Uh, use strong sans serif typefaces. Make labels at least 12 pixels in height. Make sure that the label is legible from all angles and from all sizes. This is the one control that I'm going to talk about that has no picture. It has no visuals. This is the scroll viewer. A scroll viewer uh, basically has nothing until you begin to scroll it. Then you're going to see a scroll bar. But basically what it does, uh, it contains an array of content that wouldn't otherwise fit in the intended area. The scroll viewer has no user interface of its own. It's a con container that provides scrolling functionality for UI items, specifically around lists and things like that. You're going to use scroll viewers all the time in your designs. There's not a lot of visuals around it. When you start scrolling, you'll see a scroll bar. Uh, but anyway. I thought you should know about it. It's going to be a powerful tool in your toolbox. Next, a slider. I've mentioned these a couple of times. The slider control basically allows you to set values in a range from zero to top, and you can set the range. If there's clicking or points along these, you should always have a visual cue, little teeny lines. I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but there's little indicators of snapping points along this. Uh, characters of the sliding control, applications can either use a horizontal or a vertical slider. Um, only the extremes of a range are described in the labels of the slider. For example, low or high. They don't have a notch for every single one. Uh, and a couple of how-tos. Don't use a slider control as a progress indicator. You have your own progress indicator for that. This is for something totally different. This is for user input. Progress indicators to, to tell you what's going on with the device. This is for you to tell the device what should happen. Uh, don't label every tick mark. Only the outside, high and low, should be labeled. 
don't change the size of the thumb from the default size. We thought long and hard and did a lot of user research in Windows Phone Design Studio about what the sizes of those hit targets should be. You can edit them, but by rule of thumb, don't unless you're going to make them slightly bigger. Um, don't make a slider control track anything but a straight line. Making it a curvy line is really difficult to do with the gestures built into it. The slider control has a large hit target region. To maintain good touch accessibility, one, don't put a lot of items right up next to it, and don't position it clo too closely to the edge, because remember when we were talking about hit targets? The so slider control is one of the controls that we built in negative hit targets. The easiest way to hit it is to give it a little space on the sides, like you'll notice in the last slide, and the actual hit target actually comes out to the edge of the screen. If you bump the visuals to the edge of the screen, most of your hit target will actually not exist. So leave a little space on the sides. We recommend that with every control, though, on Windows Phone. Um, like any drag enabled control, the slider control shouldn't be used in a control itself that supports dragging. A great example of this, don't put a slider control in a pivot or a panorama. Both of those pan left to right to look at different data or different contexts on the same data. Uh, if you have a slider control and actually hit those, it'll become very confusing. Next, progress bar. This is the thing that I said don't use a slider control for because we got a control for you. Uh, the progress bar uh, can be put anywhere. We have a control that allow it to be set anywhere on the stage. However, we actually have one built up uh, into the system tray. And you can turn this on and off at any given point. The progress bar has two different visual states. There is the determinate state, which basically means we've determined how long and how much data we need for it to finish. And this is a solid fill line that fills all up. And then there is the indeterminate state which is basically a bunch of little dots that s animate across the screen saying something's happening, we're loading something, but we can't tell you the exact moment it's going to be done. This is the different visual states uh, of uh, connecting indeterminate and determinate. Next, list boxes. List boxes um, are common UI that you're going to see everywhere throughout Windows Phone. Uh, a list box control presents a fixed size scrolling selection of items. It has a built-in scroll viewer on it, that control that I mentioned earlier. Users can swipe vertically up and down. Uh, if you're not going to swipe up and down, I just recommend using a scroll viewer with some different content. That's not really what list boxes are meant for. Um, and users tap the control to select an item. There's a selected item built into list boxes. List boxes are used throughout Windows Phone. It's very long, and some of them can get really uh, long, long, long lists. So they've built virtualization into the list boxes. If you're going to have a super long list, you might want to use a list box. So a couple of list box how-tos. Use strong sans serif typefaces. Make list items and text at least 12 pixels in height, and make sure that the text is legible from all angles and sizes. That's very important for any UI element. And then reserve, reserve your illumination effects and animations and things for the selected item when it comes to your list box. Don't uh, have all the items illuminated or different colors and things like that. Just really focus on the select, selected one. Um, another thing to note, don't have super complex layouts that have different heights and widths on the items inside of a list box. If they all have the same height, they will be much more performant. And this is just something I've learned from writing multiple Windows Phone applications. Uh, the next thing is a control that we provide for you, and it's everywhere in our UI. It's called the Long List Selector. I know, it's a very Microsoft title, Long List Selector um, Ultimate version 5. right? But uh, it allows you to quick jump in a long list that has categories. These can be alpha, um, uh, A to Z. So you can use a long list selector control to control screen, uh, conserve screen real estate when you want to preserve a long list of words, numbers, or visual elements from the user to expect um, it, that the user is expected to choose. Uh, so it, basically what a long list selector does is it has top title categories. So you have an alphabetical list. And then you have these things called group headers. And when a group header, if we go back to the last screen, hits the top of the screen, it stays there. It's a sticky group header, and the content slides underneath it until the next one hits and bumps it off. Uh, if you tap anywhere on, these, on any of the headers, and there will always be one on the screen because the top one always stays there, 
you will fire open a list and it will be of all the different options in there. Ultimately, this can scroll if you have more characters, but it's default for A to Z, so it should fit on the screen. And then if you click the letter M, you will jump directly down to the M. There's other header groups um, that look slightly different than the alphabetical one. So a couple of long how-tos. Uh, use strong sans serif typefaces once again, and then also reserve the focused uh, state for when it's selected, not for just anything at random. Media element. Uh, so the media element is pretty straightforward. It actually doesn't have the controls built into it. You're going to have to build those on your own. Some other developers have built this, but it's basically the element that you'll be able to use for streaming video and watching video and doing all kinds of fun kind of stuff, even with your animations. Next, text. There's a lot of different ways to deal with text. Obviously, we have rich text box, password boxes, uh, a default text box, and we have keyboards to talk about. So I'll dive right in and kind of tell you what your options are on all this. The first and the very basic one is text block. So text block uh, basically is just any element uh, that displays a fixed amount of text and is used to label controls. So it's basically anywhere in there and anytime you want to show up some basic text that doesn't have functionality, you can't edit it, it's not a button, it's a text block. A text block control doesn't include actionable controls at all. The next uh, is the text box and text box is an editable control. A couple things to note about the text box is as you type, it'll animate and get taller if you don't define the width, the height. So you can create a height on it, or by default, it will fit one line of text, and as you type, it'll continually get bigger. Uh, you can tap it for focus, and automatically a keyboard will slide out, an on-screen keyboard. Tap and hold will allow you to put precise caret location. So if you want to make a selection, you can move your cursor directly onto it in between a certain amount of letters. Tapping on a word will select that whole word. So a couple of text box how-tos. Once the user has entered the text box in the control, uh, consider how it will react visually if they tap that same text box control again. So this is important to remember, especially in like if you're creating a browser with an address bar. If you want to tap in there, you might want to just put the cursor on the end and add things if it's a normal text box. But if it's something like an address bar, you might want to select it. It might want to select all the text so you can type in a totally different domain. You have control over that as a user um, or as a developer and a designer. So think about that interaction. If you find yourself assigning special meanings to specific values in your text control, try the checkbox or radio controls, which allow the explicit, uh, explicit user selections. Next is password box. Password box is like a very discreet text box. Um, basically what it does is as you type, it hides the characters so that someone can't see your password. Um, it shows the last one that you've typed for just a second and then it disappears into a, an obscure character so that you can't see it. This is very good for passwords. Use it for all cases of passwords actually. Next we're going to talk about the rich text box. Um, rich text box allows you to put some formatting text add hyperlinks, adding inline images, and adding content programmatically. You can use this for like a word editor type situation. You can use it for all kinds of different things. It actually just has way more control over it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to use it, but if ever you need richly formatted text, this is the way to do it. A couple of the notes about text and keyboards. Um, we have a lot of different types of keyboards, and one of the really exciting things that came out uh, with Windows Phone 8 is the ability to protect your next word. So we have a candidate window up at the top that's scrollable left to right that allows you to select a word. As you type, it'll guess the next word. So you can say, I found this out the other day, I am going to get, go get some dinner now without ever typing anything but the I and then space and then it begins to give you options of words. This is very exciting. It used to be that you had to type a couple of letters and then it would give you a really good guess of what the next word was. Uh, now they're doing a much smarter algorithm in Windows Phone 8. It's a very exciting feature and a very dimmable feature to your friends and neighbors. Another thing that you can use is an auto-suggest uh, control and then finding uh, kind of the options for them. That's going to take a little bit more programming for you. Uh, we'll move on to web browser. So the web browser control, make the text size the minimum requirements for Windows Phone, right? That 15 points that we talked about. 
One of the things that's really easy to do is throw a web browser control on there and not think about that. Uh, but that can really screw up your application and the UI in the application. Make sure the website loaded inside your web browser control is formatted correctly for a mobile device and uses colors, typography, and navigation that are consistent with the rest of your app. Uh, one of the things that you might be able to do is design and CSS your application or HTML page that's going to pop up into this control to look like it's natively part of the application. Another thing that's going to be difficult to get around, by default, when you gesture and interact on a web page, the way it bounces in that web browser control, it's going to do that in, embedded in the page. So just know that's going to be a part of it. Input fields should be sized appropriately. You don't want them too small, uh, since users may not uh, be able to expect that they can zoom or enter text because they may not know that it's a web browser. If a web browser control doesn't look like it's the rest of your app, consider alternative controls or ways to accomplish relevant tasks. Similar to this is our maps. Uh, maps are made available, and you can use this API and program against these APIs in Windows Phone 8. Uh, the default mapping system is Nokia Maps, and that wraps up our conversation about controls. All right, so our next section, after we finished up our talk about controls, is of course APIs on the device. And so our APIs are different things that we've made available to you through either from the hardware or for, from other different uh, um, global locations that you can sort of augment your existing applications and make them that much better. So first we're going to talk th through some of the sensors that are going to be giving you data back. We have an accelerometer, a GPS, proximity sensor, gyroscope, camera, compass, and a light sensor. All these sensors are bringing data off the phone. So the very first one that everyone kind of knows this word now since smartphones are in everybody's pocket is the accelerometer. Windows phones are no uh, exception to this rule. They have great accelerometers. Um, it's basically an electromechanical device that measures acceleration left or right, how the phone is moving around, right? Um, de developers creating applications need this sort of sensory feedback, and it's really great for games, right? Yanking around and playing th games like marble type rolling games and things like that. We have a GPS sensor, and a GPS is basically assisted global positioning system that uses a couple different ways to determine your location. Um, it determines the location of the phone and provides information to location services on behalf of the phone. Um, this is also something that's really handy. Uh, you can use this in conjunction to your mapping um, and the maps that you've been working on or using in your application. It's just a simple uh, thing to bring your mapping application to the next level. We also have a gyroscope sensor. Um, the Windows Phone, since the beginning, uh, has, has a gyroscope that allows you to get X, Y, and Z locations off of the data from the gyroscope sensor. Compass. Uh, the compass is basically the same as any compass that you'd use anywhere. It's nothing super complex, but the compass is used to determine navigation direction relative to the Earth's magnetic field. It'll point north. One of the things to note when you're designing an application is this can be a little bit jumpy. Depending on if you're indoors or next to a lot of electric electronic equipment, it might be jumping all over the place as a sensor reading. You might want to take that and streamline it and smooth it out just a little bit. Uh, we already do a little bit on our side, but your application should know that that data is coming in fast and furious. Light sensors. Uh, the light sensor is used to determine the intensity of light. It basically adjusts your screen uh, to brightness or darkness. Um, when you're, as a developer, you don't really have access to the light sensor and its behaviors. There's no UI elements associated with it, and you can't tell the sensor whether the room's lighter or darker. It does that automatically. You can't override it and control it. Proximity sensor. The proximity sensor is also something that you can't override and control. It's just native and built in. It's really important for phone calls, and it basically says if the phone is within 15 millimeters of your face, it's going to turn off the screen so it turns off the buttons and the hit targets and doesn't hang up on you automatically. This is a really important sensor. It's something that you're going to use. It's going to override your applications if it thinks it's close to your face. Um, but it, it's basically uh, uh, something that you can't program against yourself. The camera. All Windows Phone cameras have a 5 megapixel or larger camera with autofocus and flash and a 4-3 aspect ratio image sensor. There are no direct UI elements associated with the camera. So you can program against the camera and a couple uh, camera how-tos 
be consistent as you can when you're creating, if you're creating a camera application. Um, try to make it mirror the uh, scenario on the phone a little bit because people are really used to using the hardware camera button. So gesture support, swipe left to preview. Um, try to support portrait and landscape orientations because our camera does. Um, one of the things about button behavior, the half press for hardware capture and touch to capture for focus. Um, touching the screen will let you focus in on that element. Uh, flash icons and states for on off, auto, front facing camera, where relevant. And then we also have a focus bracket when you tap the screen to tell you what area on that screen is going to focus in. Uh, one picture per ca capture saved to the camera roll is a rule that we have. Um, if you have more than one JPEG is created through the capture, the additional backing data should be saved on the app's local folder rather than just forced out. We also introduced a new API on Windows Phone that's pretty cool. It's called Lenses. And lenses from the camera scenario, there's a button now on the far left of the app bar that allows you to open up a new scenario, even either download apps or jump directly to into a camera app that has its own camera on it. So what you would do is click that button, you'd go out to a selector, select the application, and then take a picture or manipulate it in some way, and then of course possibly save it. There's some really fun ones that I've been playing around with that are out there that allow a lot of different manipulation to the images and the graphics on the phone. There are also rich media lenses. So rich media lenses are the exact same, um, but basically uh, these are, can be used not in the camera scenario. They can be used after a picture is already taken to apply lenses to that individual picture. Um, they're a deeper way of engaging with images that have already been captured. If your app stores additional data for editing or viewing of photos, you should consider implementing a rich media experience, especially if you, it's, it has a way of editing existing images on the device. So a couple of rich media how-tos. Check to see if an image exists in the camera roll, roll before opening it. Um, there, there's some little wonky issues that I've heard about there and gracefully handle the situation if it's missing. Rich media lenses should give users the ability to delete backing data from the device and call save functionality save as copy because it's going to save a copy. It's not going to save over the original picture and the user should know that. Maps. Use a map control with your app to let the users uh, view app specific or general geographic info without having to leave your app. In combination with the AGPS, this is a really powerful combination and you can do a lot with it. Um, a map can, control can also show aerial views, traffic, and local search in the list forms. Uh, map controls can uh, display the user's location, provide directions, find points of interest, and they can turn on and off traffic pointers. So map how to. Use ample screen space and ideally the entire screen space to display a map control. It's very difficult to interact on a map control if it's just a small portion of your screen. Audio. Of course, on our phone, we support streaming audio. We also support background audio. A lot of your applications might be dedicated to this. Look more into the developer docs on rules how to do this, but just make sure that when you're using it that you're making the controls available that you can jump back in and pause that music at any given time. Speech. Uh, new APIs, Windows Phone 8, uh, enable speech recognition, synthesis, and shell interaction so apps can be launched using speech commands as well as other commands being launched. Um, we have Bluetooth now, um, which allow you even to talk to another device, which is very fantastic. There's other ways to do this. Of course, we've had the contacts picker. The contacts picker allows you to select people. And we've got the media picker that allows you to jump in and select media, albums, videos, that kind of thing, content from your device. Some of the great APIs on Windows Phone 8 allow you to share. This is something that you should think about when you're designing your application. Um, quick ways to share out, including email, SMS, and social networks. You can pull up these APIs and quickly send out um, graphics, text, all kinds of things. I teach high school. Some of the students in my apps actually in my class made a class where you, or an application um, where you could send notes and messages and it would basically encrypt and decrypt and only someone who had the code could unencrypt them and decrypt them. They used these APIs and allowed them to share with SMS. They could uh, email them. They could send them to their friends in lots of different ways and their friends could uh, decrypt them and encrypt them on another Windows phone. Windows Phone 8 
uh, enables NFC and wallet, tap to share, as well as the wallet option to carry around all of your data, um, your uh, credit cards if you'd like and make payments directly from your phone. Uh, this is all very cool. A couple of other miscellaneous uh, APIs are the Wi-Fi. We've got calendar APIs, um, in-app purchases, and a whole advertisement platform. These can be found on developer dev actually .windowsphone.com. Um, and this brings us to the end of the APIs section. And the last thing we're going to talk about today is some quick ways to get your ideas onto the phone, on Windows Phone 8. So there's a lot of different ways to do it and a lot of tools to do it, but a lot of times you're just trying to get your concepts across in a really quick and dirty way. One of the things that I do re pretty regularly when I'm trying to come up with an idea or trying to get an idea across is I just use note cards. I've got a pen and I've got note cards and this is a regular thing we've do done on the design team is just sketch out your ideas for applications and we put them all out and we line them all up. The very first thing you can do is kind of get a high level of what's going on in your application and starting from one screen, you can move to the next and press through and kind of get that scenario. Right after that, one of the things that works really well is starting to see these on device. The main thing that you can do just really quickly is actually take pictures of these screens on your phone and then you will see them on your phone similar to how they will lay out on the device. You can put this in front of someone very quickly just by handing them the phone and then asking them to click through your application or press through and then you can slide through and see what the individual screens are going to be like as you move from item to item. You can do a more complex version of this by importing these into Visual Studio and Blend. You could put opaque buttons over the top of them and allow navigation from screen to screen in that way. But using this quick and dirty way of prototyping, you're able to get your screen an idea from a card onto your phone in little or no time and into somebody else's hands so they can test it and give you feedback back on how that application works. Uh, lastly, it Im improves usability that much more uh, when you have uh, an example, a visual example in front of them of what it will look like when they are playing with your application, but this also works for design files. Save out your images as a PNG and just email them to you or put them on your device in any number of ways. And this will be a great and simple way for you to test out your application design with other people and get their feedback on it. Uh, this is just a quick segment, but a little note and an important one about prototyping on Windows Phone 8. Thank you. Mm -hmm.